So um, I'm still recovering. I am recovering well. I told someone this morning, good morning. I'm, uh, I think it started over again. Anyway, I'm recovering well, but I'm still not able to go to church. So I'm going to go ahead and do this week's Sunday School lesson live. Um, in the meantime, the class is still meeting, so this coincides with what they're studying. Hopefully next week I'm back in the classroom. So we're looking at numbers 9 and 10 today. So let's get started with some prayer and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for this time. I pray that the words that I speak, that you work through them, that you teach us more about you and how to be closer to you. I pray for those that are, are listening. I pray for those that are in the class that it's just a time of blessing and learning more about you. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so Numbers chapter 9 verses 1 through 5 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of Egypt, the land of Egypt, saying, Let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointment, appointed time. According to all its statutes and all its rules, you shall keep it. So Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So the people of Israel did. So it's been a year since they've left Egypt. Um, the first Passover was the last night in Egypt. It's a year later, time for the second Passover. This is probably a pretty emotional reminder for them. Um, their slavery in Egypt was still fresh in their minds. This is a, the first year of their freedoms and their memories are still strong. They probably still remember the cries of their Egyptian neighbors as they discovered that their firstborn children, their firstborn sons were killed. They remember the stress of packing everything and quickly and leaving Egypt. They remembered the terror of the Egyptians chasing them and the parting of the Red Sea. They remembered arriving at Mount Sinai and actually hearing the voice of God. God told them in Exodus 12 through 14 that they were to keep the Passover throughout their generations and that they were to keep it in the same way as the original year after year. Unfortunately, in chapter 14, we're going to run across a problem that causes them to stop celebrating the Passover or commemorating. After the second Passover, they're not going to celebrate Passover until Joshua chapter 5. And because all of these people are going to die in the promised land, that means none of these people except Caleb and Joshua would ever celebrate Passover again. But they weren't just to keep a ceremony, but they were to remember why God passed over them because he was their God and they were his people. So one of the actions of Passover was to apply lamb's blood to the doorposts of the home. But now they're in tents. We don't get information on, do they put the blood on the tents or, or what do they do? We don't get that information. And when we don't get information, it's not important, but it's interesting to think about. And we see the phrase in Zeth that they did it again they are so obedient right now <laughs> but in chapter 11 that's all going to end now verses 6 through 14 and there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body so that they could not keep the passover on that day and they came before moses and aaron on that day and these men said to him we are unclean 
through touching a dead body? Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear that what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month on the fourteenth day at twilight they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones according to the statute for the Passover they shall keep it. But if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger sojourns among you and would keep the Passover to the Lord according to the past statute of the Passover and according to his rule, he shall do so. You shall have one statute both for the sojourner and for the native. So, this passage is about resolving two problems. Problem one, every Israelite must be included in the Passover. But there's some of them that aren't clean. So they couldn't participate in the Passover with the community, but they wanted to. These men were bold enough to ask Moses for an exception. And Moses doesn't just take it off the top of his head. He goes and talks to God. It wasn't good to keep people from celebrating Passover, especially those that really wanted to. But it was really bad to, to disrespect God's holiness by allowing those that were ceremonially unclean to participate. God hadn't given instructions on this point, so Moses did need to ask. So the solution, they could celebrate Passover one month later. Now this obviously doesn't apply to lepers. It was only for those who would be clean in the next month. But God adds more, answering more than Moses asked. If you were clean and not traveling, you must keep the Passover. If you didn't, you were cut off from God's people. You were kicked out of the camp. Another way to look at this is those who refused to keep the Passover were responsible for their own sin instead of it being lain on the Passover lamb. Even those who were not Hebrew but were traveling with them, they had to celebrate the Passover or be cut off. Verse 15, on the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So this cloud of called God also called the Shekinah glory. It shows up at different times in Israel's history. For example, when Solomon built the temple, the cloud of glory filled the temple. You see that in 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11. When Israel was completely turned away from God and before the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, we see the cloud of glory departed. You see that in Ezekiel 10, verses 3 through 4 and 18 through 19. So when the cloud was there, it provided comfort. It showed that God was there. And the cloud provided shade in the, in the hot sun, and at night it provided warmth because it was fire. Verses 16 through 23 says, so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out. And at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. 
Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time, Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord they camped, and at the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. Oh, so Israel had been organized, cleansed, set apart, blessed, anointed, but they still needed to be guided step by step to make it to the promised land. We as believers, we still need to be led by the presence of God. When it says, so it was always, that means that cloud stayed with them day and night through this time. Can you imagine seeing this cloud every day? We know they will eventually start taking it for granted. But we also see a cloud in play a part in Jesus' life. Jesus was overshadowed by a cloud at his transfiguration in Luke 9, 34. And he disappeared into a cloud at his ascension, Acts 1, 9. These clouds represent the presence of God. So the movement of this cloud was unpredictable. Uh, the Israelites were led by God, not a routine. They had to respond to the presence of God. And you can see sometimes they camped for a while and sometimes it was overnight. It doesn't say it, but every single time they set up that tabernacle and every single time they had to tear that tabernacle down because they didn't know ahead of time whether it was gonna be overnight or a month. So that tabernacle was set up. Those um, Leverites, they are getting their work out here. Can you imagine living a life when, where you have no idea when you leave? And once you get to the next spot, you have no idea how long you're going to be there. The phrase, at the command of the Lord, they marched or camped. That's repeated seven times in here. This is all about obeying God. And we see that they are to pick up and move and they had no advance warning. But it would take time to pack that tabernacle and for the regular person to get packed. It, this organization thing is really a help in this situation. And as they moved along and packed up more and more often, they probably got really efficient at this. Numbers 10, verse 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work, and you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. So the two silver trumpets, that's kind of like their, their intercom system. There are trumpet calls that call them to march, call them to battle, call them to gather together for assembly and other things. The, these trumpets are different than a shofar. A shofar was used to announce the Day of Atonement and at Jericho, and a shofar was usually made from a ram's horn. So it probably took months to make these trumpets. So this is another example of things that might not be in chronological order. Josephus, the Jewish historian that lived during the time of Jesus, he describes these trumpets. And they're also pictured on the Ark of Titus in Rome. They were straight pipes, less than 18 inches long, with a flared opening at the end. Think of a herald trumpet that's about a foot and a half long. Their sound was bright and piercing. You can imagine they had to be pretty loud to, to be heard throughout the camp. 
Herod's temple um, had an inscription on the corner of a ledge that said the place of trumpeting. So on the temple they had a specific place for these trumpeters to stand once they build a temple. Verses 3 through 10 says, And when both are blown, all the congregations shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the head of the tribes of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm, the, camp, the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who opposes you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feast, and at the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. So there's different trumpet blasts for what, what was needed. You blew both trumpets together when Israel needed to come, all of Israel needed to come to meet at the tent of meeting. If it was only one trumpet, only the leaders came to meet at the tent of meeting. There was a second kind of blast that said time to move out. There was another kind of blast, probably short staccato blast, that said it was time to prepare for battle. And then there would be another kind of blast, the beginning of feast days. God says he would hear these trumpets when it was warfare and he would act on behalf of them. The statement says that the trumpets remind God to be with them in battle. Of course, God never needs a reminder. Maybe the idea is more of that the Israelites needed to be reminded who is leading them. And notice who's in the band. Aaron's sons, the priests. So these trumpets also tell them when to move. Of course, you can't move two million plus people all at the same time. So it was organized that they would go in a certain order. When it was, when it was time for you to go, you knew your blast. Uh, but it only talks about the Eastern and the Southern tribes. We don't see the Western or Northern tribes, but we can assume they had their own signals too. The trumpets were also used to celebrate coronations, victory celebrations, annual feasts. There's also a reference in here to the beginnings of your months. They would blow the trumpet. This is a new moon celebration that signaled the beginning of a new month. The Jews viewed the first day of each new moon as a special day consecrated to God, kind of like a Sabbath. Any time the trumpet sounded, the people would have heard a note of reminder, I am the Lord your God. Reminders are an important theme in Numbers. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, we see God will use the sound of the trumpet to gather his people for the ultimate assembling together, the rapture of the church, to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so finally, it is moving day. Verses 11 through 13 says, In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. And the clouds settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. The signal to move, the cloud lifted. This is 19 days after the census of Numbers 1. 13 months after they left Egypt 
and 11 months after their arrival at Mount Sinai. Imagine their excitement and the busyness and the and the just all the action needed to get moving. But they marched in the way God had organized them. They are no longer a mob. Since leaving Egypt, God had been preparing them. They became ordered and organized. They had become cleansed and purified. They had become set apart and blessed. They learned how to give and they learned the function of priests. They are headed to the promised land. The journey would really only need to take a few weeks, but we're gonna see they're gonna mess it up so bad that it's not gonna be a few weeks. So this cloud stops in the desert of Paran. This is a large plateau in, the, in northeastern Sinai, south of what later is gonna be called the Negev of Judah and west of Arabah. This is at the southernmost part of modern Israel. This is the largest and most barren part of the wilderness that the Israelites will go through. Verse 14 through 28. The standard of the camp of the people of Judah set out first by their companies, and over their company was Nishan, the son of Aminadab. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Iskar was Nethanel, the son of Zuar. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Zebulon was Eliab, the son of Helan. And when the tabernacle was taken down, the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who carried the tabernacle, set out. And the standard of the camp was Ru uh, uh, and the standard of the camp of Reuben set out by their companies. And over their company was Elazar, the son of Shadior. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Simeon was Shalemiel, the son of Zerushadai. And over the company of the tribe of people of Gad was Eliasaph, the son of Duel. Then the Kohath, Kohath set out carrying the holy things and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival and the standard of the camp of the people of Ephraim set out by their companies and over their company was Elishima the son of Ahimedad and over the company of the tribe of the people of Manasseh was Gamaliel the son of Pedahasar and over the company of the tribe of the people of Benjamin was Abaddon the son of Gideoni then the standard of the camp of the people of Dan, acting as the rear guard of all the camps, set out by their companies. And over their company was Ahiezer, the son of Amishadai. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Asher was Pagiah, the son of Okram. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Nephtali was Ahira, the son of Enon. This was the order of march of the people of Israel by their commanders, and they did it. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? And they did it. Um, so, some things to notice in here. This is the exact marching order that God had commanded. They took God's word seriously here. This is the first time that the tabernacle was taken apart and transported. Notice that the Gershonites and the Merorites go before Co the Kohathites. In fact, there's some other tribes that come between the Merorites and the Kohathites. This gives time for the Gershonites and the Merorites to get everything set up before the holy items get there. This is just the beginning. There's so many challenges of faith coming their way. Up to this point, they've been pretty consistent in their obedience, other than the golden calf thing. But they're headed to a time of disobedience and outright rebellion. Remember, because of this disobedience, none of these people are going to enter the promised land, other than Joshua and Caleb. Notice Dan's tribe is listed as the rear guard. As we talked about it before, caravans were fre most frequently attacked at the back. That was their weakest area. So having a strong rear guard helped protect them. Verse 29 through 32, And Moses said to Hobab, 
the son of Ruel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law. We are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, Please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same will we do to you. So Ruel is just another name for Jethro. It's Moses' father-in-law. So this is the first time we've heard that Jethro had at least one son. In all the movies you see about Moses meeting the daughters of Jethro, we never see a son around. Where was Hobab all this time? We don't know. So Hobab must have been with him at Sinai, and Moses wants to keep it this way. Now this is probably again out of chronological order because it doesn't make sense for Moses to have this conversation as they're moving. They, they need this conversation before they move. Moses knows he needs help from wise men. When we need wisdom, God brings someone into our lives with that wisdom. But are we wise enough to go to them for counsel? Not always. Now, they didn't need Hobab for directions because the cloud's going to tell them which way to go. But Hobab, he knew that desert. He grew up in that desert. He knew where to find water, potential food, fuel, other things in the places where God was directing them to march in camp. But Hobab says, no, I'm going back to my own people, the Midianites. But Moses appeals to him to stay. He invites them to join them on God's path. That's something we need to do too. We need to invite others to come along with us on God's path. Moses doesn't take the initial no as an answer. So apparently, even though we don't hear this response, Hobab states, we're going to see one of his descendants, Jael, who drove a tent peg through the temples of a sleeping general, Sisera, in Judges. Hobab probably becomes a worshiper of Jehovah. Verses 33 through 34. So they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp they go wherever the cloud leads them and the ark of the covenant is in the lead we know the rest of the holy items are carried in the middle but they are led by the ark God is leading this procession if it stopped in a rough spot they stopped if they were told to leave a comfortable place they left so it takes three days to get to Paran. The average distance traveled by an army or a caravan was about 15 miles per day. So they probably traveled 40 to 45 miles on this first leg. Um, but what do they do at night? Do they set up their tents and camp overnight? We aren't told here. We'll find out in chapter 11. So as they're traveling this two to five million person group, you have to wonder how long it took to get going and how long the line stretched. What, could it be that it, if they were only traveling one day that the front of the line reached before the back of the line even started? We don't know. It was a long line of people. Verses 35 and 36 to finish this chapter. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. So this is Moses' prayer when God led them forward, and his prayer when they left. The prayer of 
moving, basically the idea is, God, go before us and take care of our enemies. It's too dangerous ahead unless you do this. That's still an appropriate prayer for us. God, lead us and take care of our enemies. We need you to do this. So the prayer that said to stop is basically saying, here we camp, Lord, stay with us. So Dr. Thomas Constable says, the end of chapter 10 is the high point of the book of Numbers spiritually. Things are gonna go downhill from here. So um, that is where we end on chapter 10. I'm not sure where the Sunday school class is going to end. So next week might be a little bit of a crossover, but I hope you join us next week. Thank you for, for being with me.